And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Nicole for uh, the impact of swine slurry on soil health parameters. Thank you, Nicole, and um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, she said I'm Nicole Schuster from the University of Nebraska. And basically, I'm going to be talking about that impact of swine slurry applications on soil health parameters based on using arthropods as biological soil health indicators. So kind of how we did that in our study was by accounting for the diversity and the density of these arthropods in the soil. So arthropod diversity basically reflects good soil health by demonstrating the number of different food sources that we have in the soil environment. So each different kind of arthropod has its own, of course, different types of food sources. So by finding a wide range of different kinds of arthropods in the soil, we kind of can see that there are a lot of different types of food sources available for those different arthropods. Um, the quantity of arthropods in the soil is a good representation of soil health due to the fact that that means that those different types of soil components that each of these are using as a food source are found in significant quantities in the soil and can support that many different arthropods and that quantity of arthropods in the soil. So here's one example of kind of how they, how arthropods are affecting the different levels of the soil. So you can see there on the left the different groups. So at the top is surface arthropods, then moving into the intermediate soil levels, and then moving down into the deeper soil levels. So the different functional significances are listed on the right side of that left table there. Um, essentially those surface arthropods are affecting the different types of fungal growth and different organisms within the environment at the surface. Um, important to crop growth is that intermediate range where the arthropods are affecting the mineralization of the nutrients in the soil and some of their mobility as well. So very important, of course, since that is essentially the reason that we're putting manure on the soil in the first place. Um, then you move down into your deeper soil levels where the plant growth is actually directly affected because of the interaction with the of the arthropods with the root zone and with the different mechanisms that the plants use to uptake those nutrients. So this other graph on the right here gives a little bit of an indication of which environmental factors affect which biological parameters. So different soil types, different microbial populations, the environment in the soil including pH, humidity, temperature, some of the food sources like nutrients, different metals, and then of course pesticides in the soil that are residue from past cropping and past pesticide applications will have the potential to limit some of the arthropod populations in the soil as well. So those affect on the biological side, the different species that you'll find, the life history diversity, so mortality, um, lifespan, reproduction, fertility, things like that. And then the different types of food sources that you would commonly have each of those arthropods focusing on as their primary in a specific environment. So next is our ecomorphological index. So this is how we specifically identified the different arthropods and gave them a score in our study. So on the right there, I have a chart of some of the different arthropods that we use, the different families, and their associated ecomorphological index score. Um, basically, this score is based on the level that they would typically found, be found on in the soil profile. So surface, intermediate, or the deep soil level. And then the different formation of appendages, visual apparatus, and pigmentation that you would see for each of those families. So an example within families, columbula, which is the third on that list on the right, are classified pretty specifically. So here is basically how you would do that. It's based on size, pigmentation, those appendages that I discussed, and then the visual apparatus. So you can see how the EMI score changes with each of those different characteristics, even within a specific family. Um, another good example of this is Coleoptera, or the beetle category. So there's a third in this list here, and you can see the different categorizations that can occur here. Basically, if you find something that's smaller than two millimeters, you have to add four to their EMI. A thin integument, so the wings are see-through or soft or things like that you add five more. You can also add five if they don't have hind wings, et cetera. So essentially the beetle range can, the beetles can range anywhere from one to 20 EMI also. It's all specific to what their individual characteristics are. So this is an example of pigmentation differences within a specific species. So this is Smith 
You can see on the right there, you would typically find this bug in more of a surface soil environment. It's got the longer hairs, the more developed appendages and visual apparatus, a heavier amount of pigmentation, all compared to this much less pigmented and developed individual on the left. So we would expect to find one on the left in a deeper soil environment and the one on the right in a more surface environment. Kind of as another example here are isotomidae, which are the three pictures, the two on the top and the one on the bottom right there, all of which are a little bit different. You can see in the top left, the pigmentation is a lot more significant than the other two on the right. And the visual apparatus in the top left and the bottom right are significantly more than our top right there. Um, the comparison in the bottom left is a hypogastruidin, so same family but you can see how different the appendage formation is within the same family. So much shorter appendages, can't see the visual apparatus, very plain pigmentation. So all of these things affected how we classified these. So this is our study site. We went to Rogers Memorial Farm about 18 kilometers east of Lincoln. So out there we had an exarvin silty clay loam soil. Basically a pretty good mix of several different soil types. You can see some of my percentages here, but good for crop growth and for housing these different arthropod populations. What we did was take 12 three-quarter by two-meter plots and assign four of those plots to each of our treatments. So our A plots were injection, B were broadcast, and our C were our check plots for comparison. So on those plots, we did these different types of application. Here you can see in the bottom right picture our applicator. So this is a commercial applicator, which is putting on about 46,800 liters per hectare. Um, in this picture, you can see that it is actually in the injection process. To do our broadcast, we just lifted that up above the soil and it would then deposit the same quantity, volume of slurry to the broadcast area. So that was the, our method applying there. Uh, this is our sample collection. So we have three different types of samples that we took. The first one is our 2,800 cubic centimeter soil sample, which is about a gallon volume. And those are the ones that we analyzed for the different arthropod counts and classifications. Uh, the other two you can kind of see in this picture here is a 1.5 inch soil probe. So we took a 0 to 4 and 4 to 8 inch soil core for those. One set of those went to ward laboratories for commercial processing of nutrients and different soil characteristics. The other set stayed here and were analyzed at the soil laboratory at UNL for different soil density and physical properties. The set that was taken to North Platte for arthropod quantification and classification was processed using these release funnels. So you take your samples and put them in the top end of the funnel and these lamps at the top will dry the soil out from the top down. So essentially it forces the arthropods through the soil where they drop into a 70% ethanol solution at the bottom of the funnel where they can be preserved and we can take those samples back to Lincoln and process them there. So that processing essentially took, basically we just take the samples and look at them under a microscope. So here you can kind of see a picture of what it would look like as we're analyzing them. The mites are there with arrows in red, but there's of course many more in the sample here, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like when I'm picking apart these samples, we've got isotomidae there and hypogastruidae also. Um, and then in the bottom right, you can see a vial of what it would look like after they've been processed, and you can only see the arthropods in that sample. No more sediment or other debris. And this is kind of what we came back with. So this is an example of our July 21st, 2014 sampling date. Um, you can see specifically the diversity of different types of arthropods that we found in these samples. You can also see that predominantly our injection and broadcast samples had higher counts of soil arthropods. Beyond that, you can also see some of the different samples did not have any arthropod counts um, for the check plots, which is important as well. But that trend basically stayed the same for our different treatments of application. These two were not included in the previous graph because their numbers are so much higher, but these are isotomidae and mites. Um, and you can see in the blue and orange there the different injection and broadcast. Basically, it was a lot higher for injection and broadcast for these two, which were the most abundant and are important to the soil profile, but 
isotone A there on the left, the injection is a little bit smaller, you can see, but those are typically found in the little bit closer to surface and intermediate zone. So the hypothesis on that is that maybe we disturb the environment in which you would typically find them by doing the application in the injection method. So that could be a, um, why we find a little bit fewer isotomidae in that zone. Other than that, you can see that there are pretty significant differences between the injection and broadcast and then check plot, which would indicate that by applying manure, we are adding, we are improving the soil characteristics by adding more components that support those arthropod populations. This is um, a little snapshot shot of a time frame here. So as we increased from our gray bar is before we did application. The green there is a week later. Blue is in July 21st, and then orange is in August. So you can see the gray bar. Everything is pretty even across the board. We had some kind of environmental factor occur on our sampling date one week later. I'm not sure if the soil was disturbed enough that things were dispersed when we took the samples or what happened, but you can see that it happened in all three of our treatments. So at least it was consistent in that way. But then you can see afterward that both the injection and broadcast populations increased pretty significantly compared to the check plot. So you can see that the check is pretty much the same across the board from the beginning to the end, but both of the others increased with the broadcast increasing very significantly in the last sampling. So I would say that this would indicate that the arthropods do have a, do indicate differences in soil health over time once manure is applied, different soil composition characteristics due to those food sources and due to the variety that we're finding here. I think that they are a strong biological indicator, though we do have a little more work to do on that. But that is about what I have for you today. These are my references for some of the different images and everything, but